It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. It's good to see all of y'all. And we know there's a, a number that are out. Some of them, there was some something yesterday that pulled pulled some of the church away. Something small, some some little activity. Now, for those of you, if you don't know, um, Landon and Brittany had their wedding yesterday in Oklahoma. So the gossips are are still uh, still there. And brother, you can pull me down a little bit if you want to. It's not so ringy in the house. I don't need too much in the house. But um, so they're not with us this morning. Of course, we miss them being here. But I'm I'm glad you're here. Uh, I'm excited about what God's going to do and. We're glad to have uh, Darian and uh, Miriam Sparks with us this morning, and they'll be preaching for us here in a little bit, so make them feel at home and welcome, and we're thankful for, for people to come alongside and help us in what we're doing. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit this morning, and I didn't plan this on purpose, but it lined up this way. You know, Brother Gossett and I usually sit down and plan out, y'all know, we plan out the calendar year, at least as far as teaching goes. We usually don't plan out the preaching, but the teaching, we plan out the calendar year, and in the last three weeks, we've just had this bit of a gap where we didn't have any specific things. So well, the gossip took one of them, and Andrew took, did a wonderful job last week, didn't he? Um, took one of them, and in, in this one, I was thinking about what I should talk about. It didn't even occur to me that we had Brother Sparks with us today, but it just felt like I should teach about preaching, the purpose and practice of preaching. It's something that we come to church and we receive and we sit in the pew, but when you think about it, uh, preaching is kind of a weird thing. It's very, uh, you know, if you're not, you, if you don't come from a church culture, um, it can be a very strange experience, especially if you're in a Pentecostal church like us or an apostolic church where the preacher really gets after it. And, um, you know, sometimes we get really excited. And I've, I've had one response uh, that we've heard is, is, you know, well, why is he yelling at everybody? Like, is he mad at us? Well, no, he's not. I mean, uh, well, maybe sometimes. <laughs> You know, depending on who it is, but no, he's not mad. He's he's passionate, and it's uh, you know, it's. So, what is this preaching thing? And maybe I'll start with you know, most of you have been around church and in church, so, uh, you know how it goes. You're not safe in teaching, and you're not safe in preaching. Sometimes those are the same thing. Um, what do y'all think? What does it mean? What is preaching? Any thoughts, ideas? I know I'm making you think early. Not prepared. What is preaching? Communicating God's word. Being fed the bread of life. life. So it's how we learn about God. It's part of the diet of the church. It's part of a healthy, regular diet. So those are both good definitions. Um, And, you know, we think of preaching as a New Testament thing, but even Isaiah said, God, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the acceptable time of the Lord. And Jesus quoted that, and people got upset. What I want to do this morning is I want to look in Scripture. What does Scripture tell us about preaching? I want to go to a couple places in Scripture, and then I want to talk about kind of how we, what do we do with this? So the first place I want to go is Mark chapter 16. And uh, if you're familiar with this passage, most of us are pretty familiar with Mark 28, right? 28:19 is the Great Commission go into all the world, teach the gospel, or uh, make disciples, teach uh, all nations uh, what I've commanded you. Uh, Mark 16 is another account of the, um, we'll start with 16, chapter, or chapter 16, verse 14, Ryan. It's another account of um, that uh, commission that God gave to the apostles. Afterward, he appeared to the 11, to the 11 themselves, as they were reclining at table, and he rebuked them for the unbel- their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. Right? Mary and some others had seen Jesus, and they told the apostles, and they didn't believe him. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. Now, this is the same account, the same time. Uh, This is Mark's recording of that same thing that happened in Matthew. And in Matthew, uh, you know, we can 
do a compare and contrast, in Matthew 28, 19, Jesus talks about teaching them to do all that I've commanded. One thing that we have to remember when we're reading the accounts of Scripture, you know, if I'm going to speak for about 40 minutes this morning, roughly, and if you were to summarize what I said in two or three sentences, try and get the main points, if I asked Angelo, you to summarize it, you'd have a summary. If I asked Brother Leo to summarize it, he'd have a summary. And you would probably both pull out different pieces of that and and phrase it differently from what you took away from this longer thing. And that's what we're seeing here. So this is one of the reasons why there's parallel accounts. God is giving us uh, the same story through different lenses. And uh, if you remember, the different accounts usually have different purpose, right? Matthew is writing um, to establish Jesus as a Jew and establish him as the Messiah. Mark is writing uh, more to, um, he's writing to a different audience. Luke is writing to a different audience. John is presenting Christ as uh, God, right? So he's presenting a different view. So you're getting different um, retellings of the same story to help you see the big picture from multiple points of view, right? And so with this, we see that the great commission that God gave the church was about going into the world to tell the gospel. And it was preaching and teaching. It was making disciples and proclaiming the good news. So Jesus, that proclamation, that is preaching. Proclaim the good news. Jesus commanded them to preach the gospel. Preach the good news. And what we see from this passage is why we preach. Because salvation comes by active belief in the message. If I hear it and I believe it, and my genuine belief leads to action, right? He said, whosoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Now, y'all have heard me say this before, but I'll echo it here. If it doesn't lead to action, it's not really belief, right? It's just knowledge. Like, I know that Sauron forged the one ring in the fires of Mount Doom, but I don't go looking for the evidence of Gandalf and Frodo. I know it, but I don't believe it's true. I understand the story, but I don't believe it. Right? Too many people know the story of Christ, but they don't believe it. If I believe it, I'll do something with it. That's the biblical understanding of belief, right? A biblical understanding of belief is it leads to action. And the other thing we see from this scripture is that the power of God followed those who proclaimed the word and those who believed the gospel, right? We saw, uh, he mentioned all sorts of signs that should follow those who believe. And that should be a sign of a godly, healthy church. If you're trying to figure out, you know, if you're looking at someone's ministry or a church and you're trying to understand is this right? Is it wrong? I don't have a doctorate in divinity. I I, I don't feel qualified to judge their interpretation of scripture. I will point out that scripture was meant to be approachable. I don't think you have to study for 20 years to to be able to understand scripture. Um, But although study is not bad, I'm not, I'm not denigrating that, but, but there's a very easy way to see is the power of God in the church. Do you see the spirit of God working in the church? Jesus, uh, Jesus criticized the Jewish leadership for seeking after signs. And so we don't, we don't chase the signs, but we should see the evidence of the work of God, right? It's kind of like this fruit of the Spirit. If I'm a Christian and I'm living uh, as a Christian, how do I know that I'm actually successful in my attempt to be like Christ? Well, do I see the fruit of the Spirit? Do I see love, joy, peace, kindness, long-suffering? Do I look like Jesus Christ? If I don't, It doesn't matter what I say, somehow my belief is not leading to fruit. And this is what we see, effective godly preaching should lead to the work of God happening. So the power of God followed the believers. We don't chase signs, but we should see the evidence of the work of God. And this is one of the things that separates motivational, inspirational speaking from preaching. This is one of the things that separates lectures and Uh, talks from learned people. And again, I'm not against these things, but preaching is something different. This is why we don't require someone to have a doctorate before we allow them behind the pulpit. Uh The primary requirement to be behind the pulpit is you need to be led by the Spirit of God. Amen? Amen. 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 Preaching can be inspirational, and I would argue it should be motivational, although you can be motivated by a lot of different things. (laughs) 
But inspiration and motivation are byproducts of what preaching actually is. Fundamentally, preaching is about proclaiming the gospel, like Mark 16 says. It's about being a witness for Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth, like Acts 1 says. And it's about Jesus and him crucified, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians. And each one of those examples is accompanied by the power of the Spirit of God. It is the result of the leading of God. So we just read Mark 16, 17, which talked about the power of God accompanying those who preached and believed. In Acts chapter 1, if you remember, this is Jesus talking to the disciples before he ascends, and he tells them that you will receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. This is Acts 1, 8. And because of that power, you will be witnesses to me, to Jerusalem, to Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, which I'll read a little bit more here, Paul says that he decided to know nothing except Christ and him crucified. And he pointed out that he was, he didn't come with strength and power of his own and great words and great soliloquies and eloquence, but he came with the demonstration of the spirit and of power so that their faith wouldn't be in his wisdom and his words, but in the power of God. So preaching is the proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ, and it is accompanied by the power of God leading the preacher, and we should see the result of the power of God in the, the, mess, the message. So that's what I get from Mark 16 about preaching. Now I want to turn to Romans 10, and I want to look at another example. And you know me, I, don't, I wish I had time to read the whole book of Romans so you had context. But you're reading your Bible, so you'll get to it. But I'll give you a little, just to, I'll remind you. Romans is kind of Paul's letter of introduction to the Roman church. He wants to come preach to them, he wants to be with them, um, and so he's sending this ahead of time to kind of lay out his theology, tell them what he's about, explain what he understands uh, as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so he's explaining the gospel, he's explaining its meaning, he's explaining its practical application, and uh, in chapter 9, he's talking about the history of Israel and how Israel missed what God was doing initially and his heart for the people of Israel because he was a Jew, their disbelief in Jesus. So that's the context. As he comes into chapter 10, he explains that now the, the plan of salvation has been extended to everybody. It's open to all. And so let's pick up in Romans chapter 10, verse 11, and we'll, we'll read uh, a few verses here. So Romans chapter 10, verse 11 reads, uh, The scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. And so Paul makes the application. That's the scripture. That's Old Testament. And he says, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all bestowing his riches upon all who call on him. Then he quotes scripture, Old Testament again. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So he's using the scripture he has to show you the plan of salvation. Call on the name of the Lord. But then he says this. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? You can't call on God and and expect him to do something with that call if you don't believe on him. And how are they going to believe in him of whom they have never heard? Uh He realizes he's about to talk to a Gentile audience. These aren't Jews that grew up hearing about the Messiah, that that grew up hearing, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. You'll teach them when they stand up. You'll teach them when you go through the door. You'll teach them when you lie down at bed. That's not the context anymore. He's going to a world that has no understanding of Jehovah or the old Jewish Testament and covenant and has no idea who Jesus even is. How will they believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Old Testament quote again. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. So from this, I see a couple things about preaching I want to call out to you. One, God has made salvation to everyone. Preaching is proclaiming, really, it truly is proclaiming the good news to the whole world. God is not a respecter of persons. He's not just looking for Jews to save. He's not just looking for Americans to save. He's reaching the whole world. We call on the name of the Lord because we believe. And I'll echo again. Because our culture treats knowledge like belief. Do you believe this? Yes, I believe. Well, if you really believed it, you would do something with it, right? At the risk of repeating myself, I've used this analogy before, but we don't think about it. When we want the lights on, 
we flipped a light switch. Well, why? Do you understand the mechanics of electromagnetism and, and how electricity works and how the light bulb works? And maybe you did when it was a filament, but do you understand LEDs? Do you understand? No, you don't understand all that details. But you believe, you know, you have a, an active belief. Yeah. If it's dark and I want it light, if I flip that switch, it'll turn on. Uh -huh. And when it doesn't turn on, uh -huh. we start panicking. Did I not pay the power bill? <laughs> Did I not? Yeah. Because we believe, yeah. and that belief leads to action. It's not just a no, well, it's dark, I wish it was light on. If, I know I can turn the lights on, but, but why don't you? Well, I don't know, I, I believe I can. Well, you, why don't you? <laughs> well, I don't really believe. I, you know, I'm afraid I didn't pay the power bill. <laughs> I don't want to find out. <laughs> if we believed it was there, we would just do it. We wouldn't talk about it. So one thing I want you to notice here when he talks about you know, how do they preach unless they're sent. One thing I want you to notice in all of this is that preaching is a pairing of God and man, right? God could do it all himself. He's capable. God is capable of speaking directly to your heart, to my heart. He's, he could speak audibly if he wanted to. He, there's nothing restraining him, but he's chosen not to. He's put it in our hands as the people of God to answer the call to ministry and to partner with him to proclaim his good news. So this might imply that preaching is more than just what happens at this pulpit, right? That it's, it's not just the responsibility of the pastoral ministry to proclaim the good news. This, this, of course, is a general principle about how God operates in the world today, right? Rarely, if ever, if you all know of an example, I'd love to hear it. It'd be a wonderful testimony. But rarely, do, if ever, do we see him acting in some supernatural way all on his own, Right? We don't see acts of creation like Genesis, where God just makes something exist because he wants to. We don't see acts of destruction like Sodom and Gomorrah, where God judges evil, and there's plenty of evil in the world he could judge. We talked about this. We don't judge because God doesn't judge. He's perfectly willing of prosecuting all the evil, but he's not. So why do we feel like we need to? But we don't see he doesn't do that like he, like he did in the Old Testament. We do see truth and consequences play out, right? We see people who live according to the principles of God reap the blessings of God, but it's a reaction to their choices. We see the people that violate the principles of God reap the act consequences of their choices, but again, yeah. it's a reaction to their choices. So, why is that? God's able, he just doesn't. What you notice is ever since Calvary, Calvary, not Calvary, God has made his dwelling place in the hearts of men and women. That is his dwelling place on earth. This is his tabernacle. This is his holiest of holies. This is where the Spirit of God dwells on earth. Not in a home made by human hands. Uh -huh. He made his temple, and he wants to inhabit the temple he made. Yeah. Um, I already taught that lesson. I can't go back there. So he partners with us to do almost everything. If you want to see God move in your family, if you want to see God move in our church, if we want to see him move in our church, if you want to see the power of God working actively in your communities, if you want to see the miraculous power of God on a national stage fixing America, if that's something you want, then you seek his face. I seek his face. I draw close to him. You draw close to him. And I get to know what does he want to do. Because he has things he wants to do. God has a purpose and a will, but he doesn't just do it. He wants to do it through his people. He wants us to do it. He wants to partner with us. So if I'll draw close to him, and I don't bring my agenda and say, God, this is what I want you to do. What I say is, okay, God, what do you want me to do? He will say, this is what I want you to do. And what you're going to say is, I can't do that, God. Are you crazy? And he's like, no, 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 no. I know, because I'm doing it through you. If it was just you, you could go do it now. But here's what I want you to do, and you're not going to be able to do it without my anointing, with, without me helping you. But then he chooses, when he has things he wants to do, in the world, he chooses to wait until a man or a woman comes to him with humility and willingness. And says, God, what do you want me to do? And then he anoints them, he uses them, and he works through them. Yeah. The work of God in our world today is not absent. Yeah. It's just channeled through his people because we are his dwelling place. Uh -huh. Amen? Yeah. Preaching is the same way. Preaching is the same way. And so, well, I'll save that for later. Um, one more, I want to go to uh, maybe one or two more. We'll see how much time we have. Places in Scripture. I want to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we'll start in verse uh, 14. 
if we could, Ryan. And um, 2 Timothy is a, a letter from Paul to his son in the gospel, his protege, Timothy. So 2 Timothy 3, 14. But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you've learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. I want to point out before we go any further here, look what Paul is doing. It's kind of tangential to preaching, but look what Paul is doing as a mentor and a father to Timothy. He's reminding Timothy and encouraging him, you are qualified. God has given you what you need, and what God has given you is able to make you wise. He didn't say, oh, Timothy, you're such a wonderful, wise young man. He said, no, God has given you what you need, and this will make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. You have what you need, Timothy. I'm encouraging you. Use it. And then he says in verse 16, All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. We, we sometimes read verse 16 in isolation, and you know how I feel about that. Um, I don't like reading anything in isolation, because I want you to notice here is Paul is encouraging Timothy to preach, to teach, and he's teaching him how to use the Word of God, what it's for, what the application's for, and he's encouraging Timothy, this is what the Word of God is doing, so that you're equipped to do the good work that God has called you to do. So now understanding that context, let's look at what he told Timothy the Word of God does. I don't think this is an exhaustive list of the uses of the Word of God, but it's a pretty good uh, way to understand. The first thing is teaching. Teaching, I think, is fairly obvious. How do I understand what God likes, what God doesn't like, who God is, what His nature is, how to be in a relationship, anything about God. I've got questions about God. I don't know Him. I want to know Him. The Word of God is there to teach us about God. It's there for reproof. And I'll throw this back out to you. What does reproof mean? What does the word reproof mean? It's okay. You don't have to. Say again? Correction with love. love. Same thing. Any other thoughts on reproof? Now, I'm not going to disagree with you. I think that is the way we use reproof. But I think the way it's used in this text is a little bit more precise. um, Because the next one is correction, right? It's good for teaching, reproof, correction. Paul's not repeating himself. Um, I didn't I wouldn't do that to get you. That's as an example, when we're reading scripture, we have to be a little bit careful because English has changed. Uh, it does mean correction, but reproof, I think the meaning that's maybe a bit closer here, because this word is used one other place in scripture, it's in Hebrews, and um, it's used to mean to prove, right? And I think the meaning here is more to test something to reveal its true nature. I'm, I'm proving out what this thing is. I'm testing it to see what it actually is. Now, think about that as the word of God. Reproof. It tests me to reveal my true nature. Now, this is not a foreign concept. We've, we've heard about how, you know, God shine a light of your word on my heart to reveal what's really in me. Psalms talks about that. David writes about that. We hear about it in James when he's talking about the word of God is like a mirror. A man looks on it and sees himself, and if he looks, if he doesn't do anything about it. It's like a foolish man that walks away and forgets. But it talks about the Word of God being that mirror. Um, for me, it might be easier. There, like, I have a, a very good example in my life of this, and you might too if you have children, because I think parenting does this sometimes, right? I thought I was a patient person. <laughs> and then I had children, and they tested my patience to see the, <laughs> the re- reveal if it was, I was really patient right? Uh, And then I realized, well, maybe I'm not as patient as I thought I was. I think I'm a good person, but then I hear the word of God, and it tests my actions and my motives. I hear it preached, and God convicts me, and I realize, you know, the word of God is tested to see if it's true, and I'm not as good as I tell myself. I think of myself as a happy person, but then I hear the preacher preaching from 1 Peter about the tested genuineness of your faith and believing in Jesus, rejoicing with inexpressible joy and, and glo- filled with glory. And I realize that I don't have the joy of the Lord because um, I'm not rejoicing. My joy isn't filled with glory. What I'm actually doing is masking my hurt, hiding my anger, 
burying my frustration and putting on a happy face. And it convinces everybody else until that preacher, that pesky preacher, gets up and he preaches from the word of God and the word of God convicts me and I don't like it because it pokes me and it tests me. And God says, are you really happy? Are you really living with joy? And it tests me to reveal that no, I'm not. And, uh, but why, why does he do that? Because that's such an uncomfortable thing. And you know, you, no one likes the coworker that goes around and points out all the things that you're purposely not saying, <laughs> right? Like, I know that we didn't do this, but we're, we, we've collectively agreed not to talk about it because it's a failing of mine, and I know it, and I'm trying to get better, but I failed in this instance, and it was good enough, we got the job done, and then that one coworker has come along and say, you know what, that was pretty good, but we could have done this better. And you're like, man, just, why are you, now you're making me look bad in front of the boss, what's going on? Well, the Word of God is not just trying to poke us in our sensitive spots and hurt us, but it's trying to test us to see what's true so that we're ready for the next thing, which is correction, which is why in our language reproof often means correction because that's the, the purpose, right? The loving purpose anyways, right? The non-loving purpose is I, I'm testing you so I can find your weaknesses and hit you. That's not what God's trying to do. God's trying to test you so he can find your weaknesses so that you know it, because if you don't recognize it, he, can, he knows all of your flaws, he knows your strengths, he knows your weaknesses, but you don't know. You think you do, but you don't. And the word of God is testing you to reveal the truth to you so that he can correct you. That's the next bit. So that the word of God can say, okay, now that you see the weakness, here's what you do about it. And then finally, training in righteousness. More than just how to correct my weaknesses, how do I become righteous like God? The Word of God is what trains me. I will um, I'll also read 2 Timothy chapter 4. I won't comment on it for sake of time, but I just want to point out what, like, so in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul gives Timothy this instruction. And then he goes on to talk about some other aspects of leadership in the church. And then 4, he kind of searches back on this. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, he says, I charge you in the presence of God and Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, by his appearing in his kingdom, to preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort. So you learned what the word of God is good for. Teaching, reproof, correction, instruction, righteousness. As a preacher, I want you to reprove. I want you to use the word of God to poke people in their soft spots so that God can help them. That's, you know, sometimes the preacher offends you. And that's, it happens sometimes. What do you do with that offense? Do you, do you hold on to it and say, well, I'm just done? Or do you say, okay, God, I, didn't, I really didn't like that. Are you trying to tell me something? Or am I just, you know, to, what, what's going on? But use the pre preach, Timothy, in order to reprove, to rebuke, and what is rebuke? Is rebuke judgment? No. Rebuke is not me saying, you're a bad person. Rebuke is not me saying, you failed, it's over for you. Rebuke is me saying, look, you're going the wrong way, you're going to make a mistake, stop, turn around. It's, it's the ox walking in this area, and the ox walking towards the cliff, and, you know, coming and hitting the ox and poking it with the goad to make it go the right direction. It's not comfortable, <laughs> it's not pleasant, but it's good for the ox. It's so that we can move in the right direction. Rebuke and exhort. Lift up. Encourage. Build up faith. Exhort. That's preaching Amen. with complete patience and teaching. Pair your preaching for reproof, rebuke, and exhort. Amen. Rah, rah, rah. Pair it with complete patience and teaching. So have compassion on the preacher because when God uses him to reprove rebuke and exhort, a lot of times he's put him through that patience and teaching boot camp where God does that reproving, <laughs> rebuking to the preacher so that he can be in the place for God to use him with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will be turned away from listening to truth and wander off into myths. As for you, Timothy, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, and do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Um, I was going to read a 
fairly lengthy passage of scripture that I don't know if I have time to get through and do it justice. In 1 Corinthians, starting in chapter 1, and then all the way through chapter 2, Paul talks about preaching. And I do want to point out a couple of the key things that I wanted to highlight in that teaching. He starts in verse 10. He talks about their kind of issue as a church. One of the issues the Corinthian church was having was they're, they're attaching themselves to ministers. Right? I follow Peter. Well, I follow Paul. Well, I follow Apollos. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a disciple of. And Paul's like, no, we're all disciples of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Like, I'm not a baptizer. That's not what I do. I preach. Baptism needs to happen. That's a ministry of one of the other. You need the whole ministry. And that's what he says in verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to, those, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Yeah. And then he goes on to talk about the wisdom of this world and the folly of preaching. And he points out that God is using, he says, it pleased God, verse 21, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. The Jews demanded signs, the Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Now, as a Christian, we lose that meaning. And you've heard Brother Gossett and I talk about this some. You know, we think the cross, to us, is a symbol of salvation and of hope to Christians. But that's not the symbol it was in the day. Jesus lost. Jesus died. His cause was, he, he was the leader of his cause, and he was killed by his greatest adversaries. He lost. So for the world, for you to say, you know, follow, follow a, I don't want to use a modern example. Um, <laughs> follow King George. He's the greatest king. He got killed in battle. <laughs> Wait a minute. He's already dead. Who's king now? George. But he's dead. <laughs> this, is not, this does not make sense. This message does not make sense. This message does not compute. Jesus Christ did not win the way the world kept winning. We preach Jesus Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, because he doesn't line up with their understanding of Scripture, and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And he goes on to remind them, look, I, I, love, I actually have to read this because I love it. Consider your calling, brothers. You guys were dumb hicks. Oh, that's my paraphrase, sorry. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful, and not many of you were of noble birth. Y'all weren't the smart people. Y'all weren't the connected, powerful people. Y'all weren't the people born with money and wealth and status. Y'all were not the cream of the crop as far as the world considers. But God chose what is foolish in this world to shame the wise. He chose what is weak in this world to shame the strong. He chose what is low and despised in this world, even things that are not. He took nothing to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being can boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. So you can say, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And then he, he talks about himself, right? I didn't come with wisdom or lofty speech. I came preaching Jesus, and that's it. And he even points out, I have the pedigree. I have the, the background. I could come as a rabbi. I've studied all this stuff. I chose to know nothing but Jesus Christ. And I quoted that a bit. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I chose to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified so that your faith is in the power of God and not in my wisdom or my good speaking. That's preaching. Now, I know we're close to time, and I won't keep you. I will point out just a couple things, and then I'll kind of summarize. I'll point out Jesus was a preacher. Matthew chapter 4, when he begins his ministry, Matthew says it this way. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus said that he wouldn't finish this thing until the whole world had been preached to. In Matthew 29, or 24, when he's talking about the end times, he points out, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So what do we do with preaching? 
how do we handle it? That clock is two minutes fast, just FYI. I've got three minutes left. What do we do with preaching? Because we're about to go and hear some preaching this morning. I think the first thing we have to recognize is we have to give grace to the preacher and be expectant to hear from God. Sometimes, you know, we bring young ministers to this pulpit, people that are trying to go into ministry, and it's, it's easy, especially if you've been in church for a while, to just kind of assume, oh, they're learning. That's definitely true. You know, they're, they're training. They're, we're bringing them up here so they can learn. But we also kind of sometimes think, so I'm going to kind of check out, right? I'm going to support them. But if you're not careful, you might miss that God is trying to tell you something through a young, inexperienced, naive preacher. Because preaching is not just Jonathan Bernard standing up here, Andy Gossett standing up here. Preaching is the preacher and God and the congregation. I didn't have time for it, so I didn't pull it up. I almost wanted to. There was a moment when Brother Blackburn was preaching to us a couple weeks ago, where he paused, and it struck me, because what I recognized he was doing, he had said something, and it was impacting us as a congregation, and he paused so that God could follow it up in the Spirit. And I felt that, and I saw it in the congregation. He preached, and then he had the wisdom to say, okay, now it's time for me to stop and for God to deliver the impact. Like in, a, in a rhetoric, the skill of preaching, that might be the point where I hammer it home with a big repetition and I, I yell and I make it big and that, that's a good, you know, there's a performative part of preaching where I'm trying to get you to feel the emotions I feel. It's, it's, not, it's not manipulative, it's genuine. I feel a passion, I want you to feel it, I'm going to use whatever I can. But he had the wisdom to say, you know what, it's not time for me to do that. I'm going to stop and let God hit you and talk to your spirit. Because it's not just the preacher. It's not just me saying stuff. There are times I get up here, and frankly, some of the messages that I feel like have landed the best with our congregation are the ones where I come up here and I feel like, God, I have no idea what in the world is going to happen. This is going to be a disaster and a train wreck. And I feel like sometimes God's like, I know, I did it to you on purpose. Like, I've tortured you this way. So you remember, you're not the one. This isn't your word. This isn't your thing. This is my word that you happen to be delivering. But if you don't listen to my spirit, yeah, it's going to be a disaster and a train wreck. But if you'll surrender to me and let me preach through you, then I will do what I want to do. So as a congregation, and the reason I'm saying this to you and not like a minister's class, is I want you to understand what happens when we come to preaching. It's different than teaching. It's a different purpose. Teaching I'm seeking God, I'm following after his will, but I'm asking him, Lord, what do you want to teach us? What idea do you want me to communicate to them so they know? Preaching is, Lord, what do you want them to believe? And I use that term very specifically the way I've defined it earlier. What do you want them to do? What belief do you want them to grab a hold of to the point where it drives them to action? The point of preaching is for me to bring you to a point of decision, belief, and action for God. And God pairs with the preacher. So when we're listening to preaching, and we're going to get an opportunity to hear very soon, we should be asking God, what are you trying to tell me today? Preaching, God has this way of saying one message from one preacher, and it hits you totally different than it hits you, and totally different than it hits you. And somehow God talks to my heart in a way that I'm like, did did Brother Gossett talk to them about me? Did he tell them stuff? Because that feels like it hit me right where I'm sensitive. And over here on the other side of the congregation, someone's having the same idea with a totally different context. Because it's not just the preacher. It's not just a lecture. It's not just a good speaker standing up and delivering a TED Talk. It's the power of God meeting the congregation. So we should come expecting to hear from God, to feel the presence of God, despite the human frailties of the preacher. We're at time. I hope this has been beneficial. I hope it's given you a good appreciation for the work that God has ordained, the foolishness of preaching that he has used to be the vehicle for salvation. How will they believe if they don't hear? How will they hear if they don't have a preacher? Why don't we close and we will shortly go into our worship service. Lord, I'm so thankful that you cared enough about us to deliver your word to us, to preserve it for us, but not just as a dead book but as something that is alive and moving in our life. If we read it, your spirit will speak to us. You anoint men and women to speak through it, and you talk to us through your word. It's alive and moving. 
Anoint the preacher today. Anoint us to hear God. We appreciate your word. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll take a few minutes and we will start our worship service.
All right, praise the Lord, everyone. Welcome, if we can all gather in. Thank you, Angelo, for getting the door. It is good to be in the house of God today, isn't it? I just feel a joy and a peace, and I'm so grateful to be able to be here. So why don't we just welcome the Lord and worship him this morning? Lord Jesus, thank you for being with us. I thank you for this family that you have put together. I pray, Lord, that as we sing and as we worship you, Lord, that it would bless your name, that you would be glorified in this place, and that your perfect will would be, would be accomplished here today. We love you, Jesus, and we worship you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All right, let's worship together. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord, we worship you. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath.
a few minutes, but don't lose that spirit of worship. Amen. Amen. I know we're missing quite a few today. Thank you for holding down the section over here. <laughs> We've got a lot of families out of town. I know there was some big event yesterday. We have a new Mr. and Mrs. Gossett, which is super exciting. Congratulations to them, and we'll celebrate them once they get back in town. Um, but we have a lot of families out. We have the Gossets, my parents, the Pierce is. Um, Ellie is at home sick. Emily had to go home and, and take care of her, so we'll be sure and pray for Ellie this morning. Um, but a few announcements before, before we go into prayer. <clears throat> um, today we had our kickoff party for the kids' Christmas play. Woo! Hopefully they're excited. I gave you so much sugar. Like, how can you not have a smile on your face? <laughs> Um, for the actors who are in the play, everyone got a script today. The actors need to be here Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. because this is when we're working on our lines and all those things. And it's crazy to think about we're doing Christmas stuff, but it's that time of year. Um, so parents, if your child is an actor, please have them here 7.30 on Wednesdays. We're going to start right at 7.30 so we can finish whenever church is over. Um, but if your kid doesn't have an acting part and they just want to come be with us on Wednesdays, by all means, just bring them, drop them off, and take a couple of, you know, 45 minutes to an hour by yourself. This is free babysitting, so take advantage of it. Um, today, after church, we have our monthly door hangers. If you're signed up, please get with Brother David after church, and he'll give you instructions. Thank you all for participating in that. We've had people come to church from our door hangers and and we're planting the seeds and we're believing God for for a harvest. Amen. Um, oh, also this Wednesday, I jumped ahead of myself because I was so excited about the play. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, instead of our Tuesday monthly prayer meeting, we're going to have it on Wednesday. Unfortunately, I don't know how this happened, but both of our pastors are going to be out of town on Wednesday. <laughs> So, um, Brother Damon will be here. He'll be leading us in prayer Wednesday night. I'll take the children. So, just come and have some time with the Lord. Um, and and it, it's always great. It's always worth your time to come and pray together with God's people. Amen. Um, October 18th, we have ladies' coffee at the Rivery Coffee House at 7 p.m. If you have questions, um, I know Sister Michelle's not here today. You can catch her next week or catch me, and I can give you details. And October 30th on Sunday, we'll have more details coming, but we're going to have a Fifth Family Fun Fest. Um, we used to have Fifth Family Sundays like way back, you know, in the dark ages before COVID, <laughs> when it's like a whole other world. So we're going to try and do that again, um, have a celebration on the fifth Sunday, just a time of fellowship, a time of fun being a family, all those good things. So you are all invited. Please invite people to come. It's a really great way to get people connected to see, oh, you guys aren't like all weird and crazy people. You're like, no, we're normal human beings and we've got issues. So come be our friends. <laughs> um, so yes, please invite, feel free to invite someone. The more the merrier. And I think that's all the announcements I have. So why don't we go ahead and stand? I know we mentioned we've got a lot out of town. Let's pray for safe travels back home. Um, let's pray for Ellie. Anyone else have any needs this morning that we can pray for together as a church? Josiah. Oh, he's like, oh, I chickened out. That's all right. The Lord knows. Yes. Praise God. That is awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Yes.
Yes. Amen. The Lord knows, and he is able and capable. Amen. Any other requests? Speak now, forever hold your peace. All right, just raise your hand if you have something, you know, the Lord needs to touch in your life. He knows the details. Lord Jesus, I thank you for bringing us in your house today. I thank you for your spirit that is so present. I thank you that we can bring any need before you. God, and that you are the answer. I pray for every request for all those who are traveling. And I thank you, God, for the move of your spirit, for filling David's mom with your spirit, Jesus. And we're just believing for an outpouring of your spirit here today. God, move in our hearts. Open our minds for what you have for us today. We worship you and give you glory and thanks. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. And the offering is open. Feel free to come up. But we're going to worship here together again. Amen. God, you are so good. You are so faithful. Lord, we pray that you would be the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus, Jesus, nothing else matters, nothing in this world will do, Jesus, your Tongue shall confess. 
confess you, Jesus, 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 oh, Jesus, Jesus, there's no power in that name, Jesus, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, why don't we worship him a little bit more? Thank you, God. For your presence, for your power. Hallelujah. We love you, God. It feels good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. I won't keep you long. The Gossets, as you know, were out of town. Landon just got married, so they're not back yet. And praise the Lord and amen. And that's good. We have with us today Brother Darian Sparks and his wife Miriam. We're privileged and thankful that they're able to be with us to get today. Yes, thank the Lord. If you know Brother Chris Green, I think he's been with us a time or two. This is his brother-in-law, and he comes highly recommended. I've spent some time talking to him before... Is Daniel's, okay, yes, it's Daniel's brother. It's Chris's brother-in-law. He comes highly recommended. I've had a chance to talk to him, and, and just I'm excited and ex expecting God to speak to us. If you're here in Sunday school, you know how I feel about preaching. So why don't we praise the Lord? Why don't we expect God to speak to us? Brother Sparks, why don't you come deliver the word of God? Let God use you this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Isn't God so good? Well, two of you think he's good. What about the rest of you? Has God been good to you? Has God been good? I'm telling you what. There is no life like living for the Lord Jesus Christ. There's, there's just nothing like it. There's nothing like it. Now, if your life ain't great, you may not be living for the Lord Jesus Christ. So I would advise you to try it. It's really good. The psalmist said, happy is he whose God is the Lord. Yeah. Is anybody happy today? Yeah. You know, and if we're not happy, maybe our God isn't the Lord. I just, just throwing that out there. I mean, just, just, just think. Oh, we're so honored to be here today. I mean, my wife, my amazing, wonderful wife, she is a great woman of God and used mightily in the gifts of the Spirit. So uh, I'm so glad that she was able to be here with us today. I give honor to Brother Goss. Am I saying that correct? I haven't. Goss it. 
I haven't met him yet, so pardon me. But I look forward to maybe one day meeting him. I hear great things about him, and, and I honor Brother Jonathan Art and his wife as well. So glad to be here today in the house of the Lord. If you have your Bibles, we're going to use them today. We came to a church. I think it's all right if we use our Bibles. I don't know. What do you think? Is that all right? The rest of you, is it okay if I use the Bible? Is that all right? We're going to go to Acts chapter 2. I just don't want to offend anybody, but maybe if you don't read the Bible in church, maybe you need to be offended. I don't know why. I mean, I'm not trying to. I just, what did you expect, right? Uh, it's so good to be here. Oh, my goodness. God is good. Life is good. And having the Holy Ghost is incredible. All right? Can I get an amen from a couple people that have the Holy Ghost? It is incredible. Acts chapter 2, uh, and we'll probably just jump into verse 14. Wasn't that teaching amazing this morning? What a great uh, lesson we received from uh, Pastor Bernard this morning. What a great word. And so I, I'm glad he set some expectations. I'm just hoping to live up to those expectations. All right? So that's, a, that's, that's the goal. That is the goal. Acts chapter 2, verse 14, and it says this, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, eleven apostles, obviously, lifted up his voice. Did I wake anybody up? I didn't do that in the mic because you wouldn't have liked me if I'd done that. But you wonder why sometimes we lift up our voice. He was preaching. Is that right? He was preaching and he lifted up his voice. Is that good? See, sometimes you got to do that if for no other reason to wake somebody up. I mean, and so I don't know if they were sleeping. No, I don't know. But he lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as you suppose. Did you know he didn't, he didn't say they weren't drunken. He just said they weren't drunk like you suppose. Uh, they were drinking something else. <laughs> we're going to talk about it. Seeing it is but the third hour of the day, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days my spirit, and they shall prophesy, I will pour out my spirit. That's what God said. So today, I'm just going to preach on this simple topic called Holy Ghost Outpouring. Is that all right? Let's, if you don't mind putting your Bibles down, we're going to pray together and invite God. God's already here, but let's just entertain his presence. From Lord, we come before you today. We're so thankful that we can. We love your spirit. We love your word. And with expectation, God, we come unto you, Lord, knowing that you are going to do great and mighty things. All all things are possible through you, and without you, nothing can be done. So, Lord Jesus Christ, we ask you to step into this house. I bind every hindering spirit by the authority of the Word of God and by the power in the name of Jesus. I bind every hindering spirit, and I loose the power of the Holy Ghost to come into this house and to move across every heart, every mind in this house today in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody say, said in Jesus name. Jesus. You may be seated in Jesus name. Look at your neighbor tell him Holy Ghost outpouring. <laughs> Holy Ghost. Couple of you didn't do it. I mean, I just uh, Holy Ghost outpouring, you know. I, I, I'm just I feel so good in the spirit today. What a great job they did with the music. And I felt the presence of God in the house of the Lord. I mean, there's nothing like feeling the presence of God. Now, sometimes we get so used to it being apostolic Pentecostals that, that it's just a norm. But I've been to some churches. And I don't really feel the presence of God there. I hate to say that. I hate. So don't take it for granted when you feel the presence of Almighty God in the house of the Lord. I mean, it's just there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it in all the world. There really isn't. And so uh, I never want to take it for granted. I never want to take it for granted. Um, I, I know that you've never heard me preach before, so there's some trepidation there. Let me put you at ease. They haven't either, so they're more worried than... <laughs> They're more worried than any of you guys, than any of you, you know. I, I did some construction growing up. Anybody else do construction? Maybe you do it now, did it growing up. Okay, I got some hands. You did construction? In wow, incredible. I didn't even do electrical. That's amazing. And, and uh, 
Wow, that's awesome. And so I did construction growing up. And, uh, you know, what I found out is it takes 10 skilled laborers, months potentially, depending on the size of the house. It could take them months uh, to build a house, especially a custom house, several months. Am I right on that? 10 skilled, took them their whole life to get these skills and they can build this house. But what I also found out is it just takes one dumb idiot to come in with a sledgehammer. It only takes them one day to knock the whole thing down. All right, what am I saying? I don't, I'm not trying to be that one dumb idiot. I understand that it took time to build this. I understand that, you know, so I'm not going to be the guy to come in and tear it down. You put your mind at ease, all right, today. I'm just going to let God do his thing. Is that all right? Can we do that today? Man, I just know God has such great things in store. We're going to talk about Holy Ghost out, we're not just going to talk about it, we're going to preach about it. We're going to preach about Holy Ghost outpouring. And so I, I, when God began to, to deal with me about uh, the Holy Ghost outpouring and, and all these wonderful things, I know it's a basic concept. Many of you are, are familiar with this already. And uh, has anybody received the gift of Holy Ghost by the evidence of speaking in tongues? So we have people that are familiar with this experience. Thank you, Jesus. So you know what I'm talking about today when I refer to the Holy Ghost outpouring. And, and I, I started thinking about the best way to approach this to make people understand, right? And one of the things I realized, and I talked to them this morning about Summer Moon. Has anybody been to Summer Moon Coffee before? Anybody been there? I got four people. It's good. If you haven't been, you, you got to go to Summer Moon Coffee. Now, other places I would say Starbucks, but sometimes I've gotten booed when I say Starbucks. So I don't know. Maybe that's your thing. I don't know. But when, when, you've, when I go into Summer Moon Coffee and I walk, I get up in the morning, put my clothes on, get dressed, drive all the way out there, go to Summer Moon Coffee, walk in the door. And when I go in the door and I smell that incredible aroma of coffee, isn't that amazing? We have any coffee people in the house? Anybody? Okay, good, good. And I go in there and I just, oh, and instantly you kind of feel caffeinated. Is that right? You haven't really drunk in anything yet, but you kind of feel caffeinated. Is that right? Okay, good, good. And, and, and you know what I do after I go, mm, I turn around, walk out, get back in my car and go home. No, nobody would do that. Nobody would do this. Am I right on this? You, we, we would say, that's just stupid. You don't get dressed. Let your alarm get up. Get up in the morning. Drive all the coffee shop. Smell it and go home. Nobody would do that. No, 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 no. You go into Starbucks or Summer Moon or whatever the preference is, preferably Summer Moon. Obviously, it's amazing. And you go in there, and yes, you go, mm, and you feel it. The environment just feels so good. Is that right? It just, uh, sorry, it's just me. I, I, I I like coffee. I'm, I'm sorry. It's just, all right. And so I just, oh my goodness. And I just, the environment, all right. And then, but I don't turn around and walk out just because I felt or experienced the environment. Why am I there? I'm, I'm there for this liquid gold known as coffee, I'm there for the product, am I right? So yes, I love the environment, but I'm not there for the environment. I'm there for, I, I go to the counter, I order the product. See, just, just experiencing the environment doesn't really help me. Is that right? I have to get the product. And once I get the product on the inside of me, then my life has changed. I mean, I can't, maybe too far, I don't know. But maybe it's not far enough I don't, for some of you. But, uh, you know, but you get the product on the inside of you, and you get that coursing through your veins, and then you realize, this is why I came. I came not just for the experience. I came for the product. I came for the coffee. All right? Now, now maybe you didn't know I'll, I'll just clue you in. This is an apostolic Pentecostal church. Did you know that? This isn't Starbucks or Summer Moon. We, we don't have bagels. Maybe you do have bagels. I don't know. Maybe you do. But, but yeah, okay, you do have bagels. I don't know. Okay. Galachis. Is that, is that right? Okay, good, good. But, but that's not why we're here. Good job. That's amazing. I, I love it. I love it. But we're not. You came to an apostolic Pentecostal church, all right? And you came in the doors of an apostolic Pentecostal church. And yes, you've had an experience filling the presence of God. But we have one product. 
His name is Jesus Christ. That's all we have. So why would you leave this place without receiving the product on the inside of you? Why would you leave the house of the Lord without receiving the product of God's Spirit on the inside of you? You have no idea how life-transforming it is until you get it, until you get it on the inside of you. And so I don't know if you took the wrong exit or if you want the wrong direction down the street and you thought this was summer moon, I'm sorry it's not. We have a product. His name is Jesus Christ. And I'm not degrading Jesus. I'm just trying to relate to you. The reason we are here is for Jesus. And it's a lot better than coffee. It'll change your life. It'll change your marriage. It'll change your relationship. It'll give you hope and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness. That's why I'm here. I'm here for the product of getting His Spirit and more of His Spirit inside of me. Because without Him, I can do nothing. I need Him on the inside of me every single day of my life. I want to be full of the Holy Ghost. I, I want to be overwhelmed with the Holy Holy Ghost. I, I want to be overflowing with the Holy Ghost. I want the peace. I want the joy. Does anybody want the peace of God's Spirit? Anybody want the joy of God's Spirit? It comes by receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. And, and so that's our text today. I'm talking about Holy Ghost outpouring. You know, how, how ridiculous would it be if I walked into Starbucks and I said, I don't like your uniform, so I don't want the product. And so we have people that do that sometimes when they come to an apostolic church. They, they may look around, oh, I, I don't like the. No, no, we don't do that. When we go into Summer Moon, we don't get mad at the uniform. What we do is we get the product. Is that making sense? Okay, so today that's why we're here. I want to have more of Jesus Christ. I want to have more of his spirit. I want to be more like him. I want more of his characterization inside of my life, his characteristics, excuse me, inside of my life. But in our text today, P Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost, very familiar hopefully with most of you. And he says, and he, he's quoting the prophet Joel, and he said, prophet Joel said, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit upon all Flesh. Did you know that Pentecost has a sound? Did you know that there's a sound of Pentecost? Let me give it to you. Acts 2 and 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as if a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. Verse 4. And they, and they were all filled. Look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor. Tell them all. All. All right. So look at this. Look at this. This is incredible. You're sitting. They were sitting. Look at you. Good job. Look at your neighbor and say, good job. You're doing it. You're doing it. They were sitting. You're sitting. The Spirit of God fell when they were sitting and waiting on the Spirit. They were all in an upper room together. Together. Look at us being in a room together. This is pretty cool. We're all sitting. We are fulfilling the qualifications of having a move of God's Spirit like the book of Acts. This is just amazing. You didn't even know it, and you're doing it. Good job. You're doing it. <laughs> yes, I love it. I, lo <laughs> I love it. Verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. Verse 33, therefore being by the right hand of God, verse 33 of the same scripture, exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. There is a sound of Pentecost and the sound is speaking in other tongues because that's how you know that you have received the gift of God's spirit. That's why in Mark 16, verse 17, Jesus would talk about it. And he would say, and these signs shall follow them that believe. He talked about believers today in Romans. These signs will follow them that believe. In my name, they'll cast out devils. They will speak with new 
tongues. They'll speak in other tongues. It's the sound of Pentecost. Acts 2 and verse 6. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak with their own language. They were speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. See, See, I understand that in Christianity today, there's the, there's this, and I'm not here to bash. I'm just gonna, I, I'm just gonna throw it out there, right? There's this thing where we say, well, well, I've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, and that's wonderful. That's a good first step in the direction that you're trying to get to. I commend you for that. That is so great. But how do you know that He's accepted you? I know you accepted Him, but how do you know that He's accepted you? How do you know that he has, where's the evidence to know that he is actually living, his spirit is living on the inside of you? This, the evidence is the sound of Pentecost, which is speaking with other tongues as the spirit gives the utterance. Now, if we go to Cornelius' house in in Acts 10.45, and we, we see there a very interesting story to further confirm what I'm talking about today. And they of the circumcision which believe were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the Holy Ghost. Listen to me now, verse 46, for they heard them speak with tongues. They heard the sound of Pentecost. The same thing they experienced on the day of Pentecost, that the same experience was happening in chapter 10. Eight chapters later, we find that in the Gentiles, how so they if you read down through that, they say, How can we forbid baptism? Seeing that they have received the Holy Ghost the same way we received it. In other words, how can we look at the evidence of receiving God's Spirit sitting in front of us and say they didn't receive it? How can we look and say, the evidence is here, but they didn't receive it? No, no, no. The evidence was speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. And so the apostles said, we're going to have to baptize them in Jesus' name because they did receive the gift of the Holy Ghost because we can hear it and we can see it. They got it the same way we did. They are speaking in tongues as the Spirit of God inside of them is giving them the utterance. It's giving them the unctioning. See, that's why Jesus would say something like this. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. See, you want to know if God, his spirit is now living inside of your heart? Your mouth will testify of it. Out of the abundance. See, James would go on and talk about how the tongue is the most unruly member of the body. No man can tame it. See, God would shoot. Now, now, if you got, some of you guys know what I'm talking about. You maybe got some neighbors or some family. The tongue is the most unruly member of the body, all right? We, we maybe know a couple people. You don't have to say their name, but you can nod your head. The tongue is the most unruly member of the body, is I right here? Some people just can't control it. And so James would come along and say, yes, I understand it is. So God would choose the most unruly or untamable part of the body, the tongue, to let you know that now he's in control. He has filled you, and now he is taking up residence and control of your life, living inside of you. James 3, 8 is where you find that scripture at. But see, so we understand that the sound of Pentecost is speaking in other tongues. Can I get an amen? It's the sound or the evidence or the understanding that we know. We've received his spirit on the inside of us. Thank you, Jesus, for that. See, see, but Peter in Acts 2.38, anybody ever read Acts 2.38? Once, good, 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 good. This is an apostolic Pentecostal church, all right? <laughs> then Peter said unto them, repent. Put, your first, put one finger up. Say repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. Be baptized in Jesus' name, number two. And you'll receive the gift of God's spirit, number three. And ye shall, or you will receive the gift of, you will. He didn't say, he wasn't like some people that say, well, I think you might. There's a slight 10% chance that you might get the Holy Ghost today. 
maybe, we don't know, it's, it's uncertain, it's unfounded. No, no, he said you will receive, you repent and you get baptized, you will receive the gift, you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He didn't question it, he didn't wonder about it, he didn't put together committees about it, he didn't have to study and do all this study for 10, 20, 30 months, no, 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 no. He understood that when you repent, you will receive the gift of God's Spirit, yes you will. And so he preached just that on the day of Pentecost. So understanding that baptism is essential in Matthew 28, 19, Jesus said, go ye and go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost. Now, you see, Peter knew that name because not many days later, standing up with the 11 apostles that were there in chapter 28, he would say, baptize in the name. Repent, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, but repent, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But he said, what you have to do is be baptized in the name of Of Jesus Christ. So either, either Paul, excuse me, Peter was lying and and all the 11 disciples decided to forsake what Jesus told them to do in Matthew 28, or all of them did exactly what Jesus told them to do in Matthew 28, and they went and baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. I think that they obeyed Jesus. I think that they obeyed exactly what Jesus told them to do, and they baptized in his name as he commanded them to do. John 3, 5 says this, Jesus, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he's talking to Nicodemus, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit. See, we have to be born of the Spirit, not just the water, but you better get both done. We got to be baptized of the water and of the Spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That's pretty serious. Jesus wasn't playing games with it. He said, you must be. You're going to have to be born of the water. And Look at your neighbor. I want to make you be friends before you're done. Tell him, you're going to have to be baptized of the water and of the spirit. You're going to have to be baptized of the water. That's what Jesus said. You don't have to get, you can get mad at me all day long. You're going to have to get mad at Jesus. As he took, looked at Nicodemus, he said, you're going to have to be born of the water and of the spirit. Both of these bap- types of baptism have to happen for us to know, according to Jesus, that we can enter into the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus said. Not me. Don't get mad at me. Acts twenty two sixteen. And now... And now why tarry thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Galatians 3.27, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You have to be baptized to be saved. That's what Jesus said. You're going to have to be baptized to be saved. And we're talking about being born of the water and being born of the Spirit. So, so why then would I be talking about, why, why then would I be talking about Holy Ghost outpouring? Let me help you with it. When you go to Joel chapter 2 and you, you get where Peter was pulling from the prophet Joel and he said, in the last days I'll pour out my Spirit. Many of you can probably quote that. You're familiar with Acts chapter 2. But what Peter was referring to was Joel 2, where Joel would prophesy of that day coming when God would pour his spirit out. Now, if you go back to the word pour out in the Hebrew in Joel chapter 2, it's actually shavak. Now, I'm sure I butchered that if there's any Hebrew scholars in the house today, all right? But it's shavak, which means to spill forth, to sprawl out, or to gush out. So what he's saying is, in the last days, out my spirit is going to gush out over your life. Has anything ever poured over you and you didn't know it was poured over you? Has someone ever taken a bottle of water and poured it over your head, like threw it on you? No, I'm not going to do it to you. He thought I was for a second. Has any, any time, oh, whoa. That was close. Did you know some water got on you? See, he knew, and I didn't even pour it on him. He said, in the last days, I'm going to pour out my, no, see, I'm going to pour out my spirit. Oh, no, that was close. I'm going to pour out my spirit, Joel said, and Peter would repeat that. It's going to be poured, oh, no, that was close. I almost did it. Oh, 
That was close. You want it? No. He said, I'm going to pour my spirit out upon all flesh, but you won't know it's been poured out. You won't know. Because nobody knows when something gets poured over you that it was poured over you. No, 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 no. That's, that's not at all. The reason why he would talk about it being poured out is because when something, watch, watch what she does when it's poured out. No. When something gets poured out on your head, you know it was poured out on you. Look at a response when it got, no, see, I'm looking for someone just to lose it, to lose it. No, no. But, but you, see, if I, now, if, when it's poured out on somebody, and they didn't know it, that we got a problem. There's something else going on there, right? Because they're going to know that something was poured out on top of them. And so the prophet Joel, being unctioned by the Spirit, would try to give us an understanding of what that experience would be like. When it comes, it's going to be like, like, like it's being poured out on you. Like it's just, it's, you, you're going to know that it's there. You're, you're going you're gonna to have the experience that just, that just you're going to know that, that it got a hold of you. You're going to know that something has gotten on your life. It's not, you're not going to have to sit around and wonder, did, did, did I get his spirit? Did I actually get his spirit? You're not going to have to sit around and wonder, did I have the experience? I don't know if I got the experience or not. I, did, was something poured out on me? You're not going to see when the prophet was talking about the spirit being poured out, he wasn't saying, well, you know, when it happens, you're going to have to sit there and wonder, did I get God's spirit? Did I not? No, no. What he said is when you get it, you'll know because it will be poured out. Oh, when something pours over you, you'll know you got it. You'll know you've received the gift of the Holy Ghost. When you got it, you'll know. You will know that something was poured out on you. You're not going to have to question it. He knows something was just poured out on him. I did not mean to do that. I thought I was holding it upright. I thought I'd put it down because I'm about to just pour it out. You know what I mean? And, uh, and so, 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 so the prophet and Peter, as, as he's referencing the experience that Peter just had, when Peter is referencing the experience that they just experienced, it started clicking in Peter's head. This is what it feels like. It feels like something is being poured out over me. There, it, I, I, I know I got it. I understand what the prophet in the Old Testament was saying because I got the experience of it just gushing out over my life. I got the experience and so he said in the last days Joel said he would pour his spirit out and that's exactly what I felt I feel this spirit pouring over me and, and pouring on the inside of me and oh it's amazing there's nothing like it in all the world I I felt the power of the Holy Ghost I didn't have to question it I didn't have to wonder about it I knew that I had it it poured over my soul it poured over my spirit it poured it poured the Holy Ghost when you get the Holy Holy Ghost today, you won't walk out the doors wondering if you got it. You'll know you got it because it's going to pour down from heaven all over your soul. You'll know you've been baptized by the Spirit. You'll know that you've been baptized by the Spirit of God because it's going to pour over your head. You see, I... When we baptize somebody in the waters of baptism, once they go down the water and come up, did you know you were baptized? Well, they're soaking wet. You don't even have to ask them if they know they were baptized. They know they were baptized. Water and spirit. So he says it's going to be poured out on top of you. And when you have the experience, it'll transform your life to the point you'll know. There's no question. There's no wondering. You know, back in the day, back in old time Pentecost, we used to say get drunk in the Holy Ghost. Oh, they got drunk in the Holy Ghost. Now, you say that sometimes now. People are like, oh, don't, uh, mm, calm down. <laughs> a little too far. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Get drunk in the Holy Ghost, you know. Yeah, but right, that, that's kind of some of the, but that's old time Pentecost. I know we don't really learn to, yeah, but, but let me tell you what, what Paul would tell the Ephesian church in, in Ephesians 5 8. And be not drunk with new wine, where is access? Listen to me now. But be filled. Can I put it in the new Darian translation of the Bible? Paul said, <laughs> be 
drunk in the Holy Ghost. He said, don't be filled with the wine of this world, but, but there's new wine that if you drink of, you'll never thirst again. If you'll have the wine... You can be filled with the Holy Ghost to the point where your neighbor who's been bothering you, they don't bother you no more. And the people you used to hate, now you love them. And I'm telling you, you can be filled to the point of overflowing to where you're drunk in the Holy See, Peter would say they're not drunk as you suppose. He didn't say they weren't drunk. He said they weren't drunk as you suppose. See, he could have said they're not drunk. But as you said, they were drunk, but drunk on the Holy Ghost. You can be poured out to the point where all the fear, all the pain, all the hurt, all the it's, it don't matter no more. I don't got that inside of me anymore because I'm full of the Holy Ghost. I got love. I got joy. I got peace like a river. I got patience. Oh, there's nothing like the Holy Ghost in all the world. There is nothing like receiving the gift of God's spirit. There's nothing like it. No wonder the psalmist would say, oh, taste and see. See, you're going to, see, I can talk about how incredible summer moon coffee is. The winter moon, the full winter moon, whoo, the full winter moon. You get the full winter moon over there, and I can see, I can talk to all day long, and you can walk in there and smell it and walk out, but until you've tasted and seen, you can't know. You can't know for yourself. That's why David would say, oh, taste and see. The Lord is good. (laughs) <laughs> see, but see, I can tell you how good it is. I can tell you how good he is. But until you taste and see, ain't going to do you no good. See, I can't drink your coffee for you when you get caffeinated. Does that make sense? Don't work like that. So you can, you can have an experience in the environment of Starbucks or whatever, but, but until you taste it, get it on the inside of you, you can't feel the impacts of it. And today, you know what's so funny? I'll just throw this in here. I'll throw it in here. So I love barbecue, but we don't have any barbecue in Portland. It's a pain. It's horrible. It's miserable. It's miserable. So we were looking around at barbecue places. Somebody told us, go to such and such a place. Now, I've learned not to say that certain places are the best barbecue in Texas because you almost get stoned to death some places. So I say such and such a place. I don't say Terry Black's or watch. See, when I start saying, I hate that place. You know. It's not the best. Anyway, you guys are real about your barbecue. You're real. I love it. I love it. I do. I really do. And so, so we were looking up a such and such a place to go eat that someone recommended to us, right? And, and so we go eat there. We didn't look up the reviews. We just went because someone we trusted and advised, and it was amazing. It really was amazing. So after we're leaving, my wife looks up the reviews, and they had some bad reviews, it was the best barbecue I had in my life, and it had bad reviews. So watch. So we, she clicks on as I'm driving, and it goes and looks at some of the reviews, and she sees that one of the top review, negative reviews that were on there literally said this. I drove by the building. It's really ugly. It's just an ugly place. I don't like the design. I don't what it like looks like. One star. Hold on. Hold on. You didn't even try the product? And you gave it a one-star review? See, we have people that do drive-bys on Pentecost. I don't like the way it looks. I don't like what's happening there. Hold on. But you never tried the product? And you're giving us a one-star review? Why don't you try the product, and then after you get the product, then you can review us? Is that all right? Why, you, you can call us crazy, but guess what? You haven't tasted and seen what we've tasted and seen. And when you taste and see what we've tasted and seen, you're going to be crazy too. You're going to be just as crazy because there's nothing like living for the Lord. There's nothing like living for the Lord. Receiving God's spirit is the best thing that will ever happen to you in the entirety of your life. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. I'm telling you, there's nothing like it. Let me tell you, we were just, I can tell you many stories. Let me give you this story. It's the mo- one, we were just in Johnson City, Texas. Anybody know where that's at? Not that far from here, am I right? We were just in Johnson City, Texas, I don't know, two weeks ago because we had to go back to Oregon. Anyway, we were just up in, right up the street. So I'll give you a story that's local. We were just up there preaching, right? And, and, and I preached about the Holy Ghost. Oh, I love the Holy Ghost. I love it. Okay. And so I preached about the Holy Ghost. And, and, and this, this lady, she runs up to the front, puts her hand 
stands up and we pray with her. And she is, gets filled to overflowing with the Holy Ghost. Other people that too, but her story is interesting because like she gets filled to overflowing. She is just, whoo. She's like, how, when, when can I get baptized? The pastor said, we can baptize you right now. Takes her up there. She gets baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh my goodness. She was overflowing with joy. It was incredible. It was incredible. But I'm just giving you what it kind of feels like when you get the Holy Ghost, all right? That's kind of what you're going to be feeling. But watch. So that's not the end of the story. So I was supposed to be there Wednesday night. So I show up Wednesday night. Pastor comes to me, did you hear about so-and-so? I said, no, no, what happened? She said, well, she went home, told her husband that she had gotten the Holy Ghost and been baptized in Jesus' name. And he said, he got mad at her. Well, I can't believe you'd do that. Why would you do it? Just getting mad, getting mad. Well, I can't believe you would do that. And he said, you know what? I'm leaving you. This just happened. I didn't mean to do that. I mean, it wasn't me. It was God. Don't blame him. I'm leaving you. But watch what she said. She said, you know what? You've never brought me as much joy as the Holy Ghost has, so you can go ahead and leave. Because <laughs> she had so much joy. So <laughs> it's just that amazing. Now, now, I'm not recommending for that to happen. But watch. But I'm just saying, it was so incredible. She said, you've never brought me as much joy as the Holy Ghost, so you can go ahead and hit the door, baby. Because this thing is so amazing. This thing is so incredible. There's nothing like it in all of the world. It's joy unspeakable and full. Full. You'll be full of the whole. There's nothing like it in all of the world. I'm telling you, it is the outpouring of the Spirit of God. Oh, I love the Lord. Does anybody love the Lord? There's nothing like the spirit of all. I know I've been going for a while. I'm going, I'm wrapping it up. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Everybody said amen. amen. Oh, okay, I'm wrapping it up. I get it. I get it. All right. And so, and so we understand that, that when something gets poured out on us, do you think we're going to know? Did anybody know that you weren't even poured out on and you knew, Right. Well, I'm going to have to do it again because some of you didn't know. I have another bottle. That's why I brought two. It's a backup. Just in case you didn't know, I can make sure you know. All right. So you thought I was playing. Okay, well, be careful. Be careful. All right. And so Jesus would say it like this. In John 7, 38, he that believeth on me, as the scripture said. Well, we already gave a bunch of scriptures of what that looks like. See, he that believeth on me. Now, if he just said, if, it, if believing was just all that was required, he would have stopped there. He that believeth on me shall be saved. No, no, no. He that believeth on me as the scripture. Well, what are the scripture? Well, I just gave you a bunch of scriptures what the scripture said. Now you know what's required for you to be filled with the gift of God's spirit. He said it like this. When you do what the scriptures say about me, he said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. What is he talking about? When it outpours on you, it's going to flow through you. And you're going to feel rivers of living water gushing out of your soul. And this spake he of the Spirit, the Bible said, because he's talking about the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I feel the presence of God in this house today. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I, I, ha I have more scriptures, but I want us to stand because I feel God in this house today. I feel the presence of Almighty God in this house. What I would like to do is I would actually, I, what I want to do, if you guys don't mind helping me, is that all right? Could I use you guys? The past, okay, good, good, good. I, I want all of us, now if you're willing and able, I want you to come join me in the front. Is that all right? Can we do that together? I want us to come together. All of us together, is that all right? We're going to come around the front, all right? I mean, not sure, not sure. And I want us to have an apostolic experience. Is that all right? Can we do that today? All right. Now, if you already raised your hand who had, has received the gift of the Holy Ghost, if you have not received the gift of the Holy Ghost by the evidence and speaking in tongues, can you let me know if you would like to receive it today? Have you received the gift of the Holy Ghost by speaking? Would you like to get it? We're gonna, you get, would you, have you received the Holy Ghost? And, okay, would you like to receive the Holy Ghost? I love it. Good, good. So I got you two. Have you received it? All right, good. Come up, come up here. You're going to come with me. Just stand right here. You can stand right here. And so, you know, when they went to Cornelius' house, they didn't have the three songs. Now, I'm not against that method. It works great. It's wonderful. They didn't have the offering. You know what they did? They preached the gospel at Cornelius' house, and the Bible says they laid hands on them, and they received the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
So today, I want you to have the experience, this experience of receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. You guys can have it. Now, ready? Now, today, it's not just for you in the front, but in fact, anybody in this place that has been a while since you've spoken in tongues, your cup isn't running over, you will be refreshed in the Holy Ghost today. You will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost today. So there's a few things I want to instruct you to do. I want everybody to do it together. Now, we're, I'm just going to give the instructions, and then we'll do it together. Is that all right? The first step is we're going to raise our hands, all right? This is the universal sign of surrender, all right? So we're surrendering to you, God. That's what we're telling God. We're surrendering, all right? Okay, the next step, you can put your hands down. The next step is we're going to close our eyes, and this allows us to get all the distractions that are around us off our mind and get our mind upon Jesus. That's the next step. Close our eyes. That's what we're going to do. Close our eyes. With our hands raised. And we're going to lift our head because the Bible tells us to come boldly before the throne of grace. Not, oh, man, I can't get. No, 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 no. Come boldly before the throne of grace. Lift your head up with your eyes closed and believe it because God is going to fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And I need people that know how to pray in the Holy Ghost to pray with me here in just a moment when we pray. All right? The first thing we're going to do after we do that is we're going to repent. Everybody, everybody's going to repent as that's what Peter commanded us to do. It's all throughout the Bible. We're going to repent, all right, asking Jesus to forgive us. The next thing we're going to do is I'm going to pray the prayer of faith, and then we are going to lay hands upon your head, and we are going, you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But what we're going to do when we pray the prayer of faith is we're going to have our hands up like this, and we're going to say, we're going to repent. When we have our hands up, eyes closed, head raised, we're going to say hallelujah. When I say hallelujah, I want you to say and everybody to say hallelujah with me. It's our highest praise. So the Bible tells us the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. He's going to come and take up residence on the inside of you. And you are going to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Is that all right? Is that all right? We're going to do it today. I'm so excited. This is going to be amazing. You're going to love it. It's incredible. It's going to be amazing. And so you're, this is, is, so when you, and what I want you to do is, after you repent, and I say hallelujah, you're going to say hallelujah with me. All right? Everybody's going to do it. And we're just going to praise him together. We're going to praise him. And then we are going to lay our hands on your head. And you're just going to, we're going to pray with you. All right? And what you're going to do is just begin to praise the Lord. We're going to pray. Everybody in the building, because there's people here that need a refreshing. I can feel it in the spirit. There's some people you haven't spoken in tongues in a while. You have the Holy Ghost. She just haven't spoken in tongues in a while. Today, God wants to fill your cup till it's over. So this isn't just for them. It's for everybody in the building today. Is that all right? Is that all right? I would like for you guys to come help me, and I'll, you can pray for her if that's all right, and we're going to pray for them. All right, so what we're going to do first, before we lay our hands up on them, I want us, everybody in the house, to lift your hands like I said. Let's raise our hands. And I want us to close our eyes. I want us to lift our head up in the air. And right now, we're going to repent. Every person in the building, God, today, I'm asking you to forgive Forgive me of every sin. If there's anything in my life, if there's anything in my heart, God, that does not please you, I'm asking you, Lord, today to forgive me for every sin, every transgression, every iniquity, Lord. I'm asking you today to forgive me of my sin, Lord, the, the desires of my heart that have not pleased you, the desires of my mind that have not pleased you. I'm asking you, Lord, by your grace and mercy to wash us. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ over every heart and mind that is here today. Lord Jesus Christ, today I ask that you would forgive us because we want to please you. We want to honor you. Wash away my sins, Lord. Cleanse me of my transgressions. Cleanse me of my iniquities. Oh, God, I ask it today in your name that you would wash every heart and mind in this building in the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm asking you today to do the work that only you can do, and we'll praise you for it. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now there is no sin. God has forgiven you of the sin. That's what the scripture says. So right now, you have been forgiven. You are ready and primed to be filled with the Holy Ghost or to be refilled with the Holy Ghost. So right now, let's pray the prayer of faith. Lord Jesus Christ, we come before you today by the authority of your word and the power in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm asking you to loose the power of your spirit to fall into this house. In the name of Jesus Christ, fill every person in this building with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Lift your voice and say hallelujah in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Come on, someone lift your voice and praise him. 
receive the gift of the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, lift your voice and praise the Lord. We love you today. We love you today. In the name of Jesus, someone lift your voice and pray in the Holy Ghost. Oh, lift your voice and praise him right now. I need people that know how to pray in the Holy Ghost to pray right now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, that's it. That's it. That's it. Come on. That's it. In the name of Jesus. Oh, receive the gift of God's Spirit in Jesus' name. Come on, lift your voice and praise it. Come on, that's God all over you. That's God all over you. That's it. Come on, lift your voice and praise it. That's God all over your life. Oh, come on, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, what you're feeling on the inside of you, let it come out. Let it come out through your tongue. Come on, you're not going to understand it, but let it come out of your tongue. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There you go. That's it. Let, that's it. Keep doing that. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Come on, let that come out in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, you're right there. You're right there. What you're feeling, let it come out of your mouth. You're not going to understand it. Let it come out of your mouth. You're not going to understand it, but let it come out. That's it, that's it. Come on, let that go. Let that go, let that go. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Come on, what you're feeling, let that come out right now in Jesus' name. Come on, let that out of your mouth. Come on, in Jesus' name. You're right there. God is all over you. God is all over you. God is all over you. Right now, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, receive the Spirit. Receive it in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, that's what you're feeling. Just let it out of your mouth. You're not understanding. Let your tongue loose and let God take over. You're right there. Keep on, keep on. Let it go. Let it go. Jesus. In the name of Jesus. 